leaving the cat. But you leave a dog for two days and he has traumatic experience. Right. Okay. Right. All right, gang. So I have started to put the page number up there too. Oh my. So you're it's easy. No, this one is easy to get to. But see, it'll be yeah, it'll be uh yeah, but it'll be like a high number because we've already done it. Right. All right, William. All right. Man straight end. Well, I'll read it this morning. Um, Lord of all being, there is one thing that deserves my greatest care, and that calls for my ardent desires. Oh, I'm sorry, Marty. I felt for some reason is this it, you weren't going to be here. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, it's up here. Okay. Did not mean to ignore you. I just was understood that something was up this morning. Yeah. All right, we'll try again. Man's greatest end, Lord of all being. There is one thing that deserves my greatest care that calls for my ardent desires. That is, that I may answer the great end for which I am made, to glorify thee who has given me being, and to do all the good I can for my fellow men. Verily, life is not worth having if it uh, be not improved for this noble purpose. Yet, Lord, how little is this the thought of mankind, most men seem to live for themselves without much of any regard for that glory or for the, the good of others. They earnestly desire and eagerly pursue the riches, honors, pleasures of this life, as if they suppose that wealth, greatness, merriment could make their immortal souls happy. But alas, what false delusive dreams are these, and how miserable ere long will those be that sleep in them, for all our happiness consists in loving thee, in being holy as thou art holy. Oh, may I never fall to, to the tempters and vanities and the sensuality and the folly of this present world. It is a place of inexpressible sorrow, a vast, empty nothingness. Time is a moment of vapor, and all its enjoyment are empty bubbles, fleeting blasts of wind from which nothing satisfactory can be derived. Give me a grace always to keep in covenant with thee and reject as delusion a great name here or hereafter, together with all sinful pleasures and profits. Help me to know continually that there can be no true happiness, no fulfilling of thy purpose for me, apart from a life lived in and for the son of thy love. So that's a good title for this. Man's great end. What is our great end? So, what do all of you think of this? It's true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think the part of what he says here is the sort of the theme of what we're talking about in Philippians uh, when we talk about the difference between joy and happiness. And he talks about all these. Uh, things that we desire, the riches, honors, pleasures, um, that could make their mortal souls happy. But alas, what false, delusive dreams are these? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it does, a, I mean, the view from 30,000 feet, it does a juxtaposition of what this life can do for you as opposed to the eternal life where your real hope and where your real great end is. But it's hard because we got one foot in this present age, one foot in the uh, age to come and we're trying to balance it and it's, that's the that's progressive sanctification. Just always going to desire the things that are in the world. It's not necessarily bad things, good things, but things that can distract us or take us away from God, you know. Last week, um, I've always loved Jaguars, especially the real classic ones, those cars. They are so, so last week, I'm talking to Donovan and, and uh, Jack. Jack owned five Jaguars. I'm like, what? How dare you? Well, you originated just a few miles from my own town. Pardon? They originated a few miles from my own town. Did they really? Yeah. And it's actually pronounced Jaguar. 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 Well, Jaguar. Jaguar. I tell you, it's like everything else Sorry, British. Because I love British motorcycles. Okay. Yeah. But you got to buy two of everything. 
Because in any, any one day, this sucker won't start. But when they do run their dream. Yeah. I was going to say, George would turn over in his grave if he heard some of the headbutts. Jaguars. <laughs> he just, he just won't. Really. Yeah. Stay away. The electrical systems on all oh, parts from that era yeah. were absolutely terrible. Yeah. I had a Triumph Bondville, which I absolutely <laughs> wanted to marry. I loved it. But if you turn the headline on, a light on, the engine stole. Yeah. Because of the <laughs> Lucas uh, electronics on it. Yeah. Oh. Oh, dear. But I do love British uh, vehicles, <laughs> especially. I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> it's apropos to this. I saw, I was down in Naples. I was looking at the new Bentley dealer. Uh, sorry, Lord, this is so apropos to this. I had a friend up in Pulaski, and she and her husband live very, very simply, um, just raising children. You know, she wanted to stay home, and he didn't make a lot of money, but they were just happy. And I, I would never forget her saying, if I look, I want. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'll never, never, never forget that statement. And I've oh. always said that to myself, don't look, or you just yeah. don't want it, and that's going to lead to buying it. That's right out of Scripture. <laughs> hey, King, after they went into Jericho, yeah. Okay, Joshua takes them into AI and they get their butts beat bad. <laughs> and the reason was because everything in Jericho was carbon and belonged to God. Achan says, I looked at those gold plates and chalices and gold. I saw it was good and I took some and put it under my pillow. Mm -hmm. And it was his downfall, his wife and children's downfall, yeah. all his servants' downfall, all the animals' downfall. And uh, they lost the whole battle with AI. Mm -hmm. Joshua falls in his face. Oh Lord, what happened? God says, "Get out! Yeah. You're sinning again." Yeah. So, yeah. One of my favorite scriptures. <laughs> People sin and think nobody will know. That's yeah. right. Your sin will always find you out. Someone said your sin will take you further than you wanted to go, take you longer than you wanted to stay, more than you wanted to pay. No, wow. That's exactly right. <laughs> true. That's a good point. You think we learned that lesson, right? As we get older, we do. All right. Anything else? Okay, let's pray. Father, I just um, thank you for this course on Philippians. Uh, we're turning the corner here, sanctification. Uh, so we're going to talk about that this morning. So, Father, thank you for this reminder of what our great end is. And it's not this world. It is the, it is the great gift of eternal life to your son. So I pray, Father, for this morning that, that this lesson, Father, would be profitable to us, as always, that our minds and our hearts would be prepared to receive and um, I just ask a blessing on it as we go forward. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, Lord, about the Jaguars. <laughs> I got to the track. Uh, I got to do a children's chat this morning. <laughs> yeah, I just found that out five minutes ago. Hi guys. Yeah, yeah, I don't think he's in here. I think Pastor is doing your he's class. He's doing the new members class. What he's doing the new members class in the library. Library. Oh, it is in the library. Yeah, yeah. yeah I go up. We love you though, but <laughs> you gotta go to the library. Yeah, find this way. It's the first door on the left after you go through. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll show you. Camera I'll show you. Oh, you. Oh yeah, Jessica. Jessica's in there too. Yeah. <laughs> He's got several others. There's about eight of them. That's amazing. I need a new uh, sanctuary. <laughs> and I had to follow Marty. She did it last week. Huh? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, Marty's good. Put it off on me, but I got a nursery. Want to swap off? <laughs> you want me to nursery? <laughs> Jones and the nursery, so I'm just telling her to take care of the job. <laughs> well, you know, when we say sanctification and we're going to study it, um, it's almost like, why, we, why do we even have to be here? We know this. <laughs> but just like always, Lawson has a way that he does, uh, that he talks about these things that uh, makes us understand sanctification uh, so much, so much more. So now we're starting into a new section. The, the uh, God, God book will start with 109 uh, that we have now. But uh, uh, when we started this series, I didn't realize that it was like a, it's 42 lessons altogether for this Philippians passage. 
uh, so or for this uh, study in Philippians. So we're we're going to move on in, uh, through this, um, and we'll take a little break in about a month. We'll be taking a break for the evangelism class. We're going to meet over with the seekers class for that, um, so that uh, they can really move through the training faster that way. So they can get us done, then move on to the other classes. So, um, so that's a sort of in the form of an announcement. So, all right, so sanctification uh, 101. I feel like I'm back in college. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's Philippians 2, 12 and 13. According to these verses, how do, how do God's work and human work fit together in the process of sanctification? How do they work together? His good pleasure? Well, yeah, it works for his good pleasure. Um, With, it, for it is God who is at work in, in you. you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So I think the thing we need to keep in mind is that we are not working towards our salvation, but we're working towards, we're working with, we're working in terms of sanctification. So, uh, so you know, we want to make sure that we have separated salvation by works you know, that this is not something that we're doing to gain salvation. We've already gained that. And I think he's going to say something about that. <laughs> we come in our study of the book of Philippians to chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. So I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13. I want to begin by reading these verses and reintroducing them to you. The Apostle Paul writes, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more so in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. These verses really lay the foundation for basic Christianity. We could call this a primer in Sanctification 101. To understand these verses is really to understand much about... You know, you know something. Our Christian life works. It's always good for us to box. review the basics and this is one of those passages that contains the elementary principles of spiritual growth. As we look at these verses, verse 12 deals with our responsibility. Verse 13 deals with God's activity. And these two are always to work in tandem together. It is our responsibility to pursue holiness but God must be at work in our lives for us to do this. So, as we look at these verses, there's several headings that I, I want to set before you. And the first is the people addressed. Notice this begins, so then my beloved. When he says, so then, it really introduces a word of application connecting what he has just taught us in verses 1 through 11 with how we are now practically to put this into practice. Paul has told us in verses 3 and 4 that we are to consider the interests of others as more important than our own. He has told us to have humility of mind. He's given us the ultimate example in Jesus Christ. He's told us in verse 5 that we must have this attitude in us that was also in Christ Jesus 
And we all just say amen to this. Well, a Christian would be opposed to this. But the real issue is, how does this work in my life? How, how does this become reality? How, how, am, how am I going to live this humility? Well, these verses help connect to our lives what he has just taught us. So I called this the people address. He identifies them as my beloved. He's referring to all believers. Uh, those loved by Christ are those loved by Paul. And this is an important uh, point that he says, my beloved, because some people read verse 12 and take from that, oh, I'm supposed to work for my salvation. No, this is addressed to people who already have salvation. He doesn't say work for salvation. He says work out your salvation. What God has already worked into you, you are to work out, is the imagery. But it's very important here that he identifies them as uh, beloved, so there can be no misunderstanding that this is being addressed to people who already have salvation. You would have to be reading your Bible in a dark room with your eyes closed, with sunglasses on, and the Bible turned upside down for you to read verse 12 and think, oh, okay, I'm supposed to earn or work for my salvation. He says, just as you, and he now leads into what I want to call the second heading, the path pursued. Just as you have always obeyed. Um, this is the highway to holiness. Uh, obedience to the Word of God. Uh, obedience is one of the chief identifying marks of a true believer, is obedience from the heart. And the word always is very important. I, I hope you can see that, because always indicates that they have always obeyed from the moment of their conversion. Uh, the first step into the kingdom of God was a step of obedience to the command of the gospel to repent and believe. The, the gospel is presented to us as a command, an imperative command. You must repent. You must believe. And in response to that, it is a step of obedience. And so from the moment of your entrance into the kingdom, you have always obeyed the Lord. You remember in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. O obedience is an identifying mark of, of a true believer in Jesus Christ. And in 1 John 2, beginning in verse 3, listen to this. By this we know that we have come to know him. That's another way of saying, by this we know that you're a true believer. By this you may know that you've been born again. By this you may know you have entered through the narrow gate. How? If we keep his commandments. Obedience to the commandments of God from the heart is one of the key identifying marks of a true Christian. He then says in verse 4 of 1 John 2, the one who says, and how easy it is just to say, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not any. Every time you tell someone you're a Christian, you're a liar. Those are pretty strong words, are they not? So obedience is not, uh, is not a negotiable aspect of the Christian life. It, it is binding upon every Christian because we, like Christ, have come under the authority of God the Father. So come back with me now to Philippians 2, and we're in verse 12 the path pursued, just as you have always obeyed. Now, this word obeyed is yet another compound word in the original language, and the main root word means to hear or to listen. It has a prefix in front of it, which means under 
And we would say even in our, in our day and time, hey, listen up, you know, that you're under this voice. And the idea is submission under the voice of the one who is speaking to you. That's what the word obey means. To hear and not to do is not to hear at all. To hear and obey is actually to hear. So he says, just as you have always obeyed. This word obeyed is a military term, uh, and it means to live up under a commanding officer in order to hear what they have to say. There's not one drop of antinomianism here. There's no sliding of obedience. Uh, just as Jesus obeyed the Father in all things, so must we obey. But he goes on to say in verse 12, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. That tells us they are growing in obedience. They are making progress in obedience. And why would that be? Because they're learning more of what God requires. The day you were saved, you didn't know everything. Uh, you, you took initial baby steps in obedience, but the longer you're a Christian and the more you learn of the Word of God, the more you actually learn of what is incumbent upon you, what God requires of your life. And so you will be obeying now much more because you now know much more in how you are to live your Christian life. So this is the path pursued, and let not a one of us in any way ever demean the word obedience. Obedience is a glorious word. And let me just mention this as a footnote. Every time God tells you to do something, God is simply pointing towards blessing. And whenever God says, do not do something, he's simply saying, don't hurt yourself. And so how good of God to give his commandments because they lead into the very center of his will and they lead into the fullest expression of his blessing. And when God says, do not do something, he is simply saying, in essence, you're going to make a great uh, disaster of your life if you go in this direction. How good of God to give us his commandments. You don't want to be down here and don't know what to do. You want the one who made you and knows what is good to be directing your spiritual life life. And it would only be a spirit of rebellion, quite frankly, that would not want the commandments of God. Well, this leads us now to third, the perspiration required. I've taken a little liberty with that heading. But when I say perspiration, I mean effort. Sanctification is not passive. There is a dynamic activity by which we are responsible to do certain things, to live in a certain way. I mean, we're not statues. We're not the frozen chosen. I mean, we, we are to move out as we live our Christian life. So notice the next word, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Work out. That's in the imperative mood, which means it is a command. It's in the present tense, which means always. This is a call for every moment of every day for us to assume responsibility and to initiate activity to work out our salvation. And when he says salvation, he's referring to sanctification. The Bible speaks of salvation, past, present, and future tense. Past tense is justification. Present tense is sanctification. Future tense is glorification. We have been saved, we are being saved, we will be saved. You understand that distinction. And so when he says here, work out your salvation in fear and trembling, he's talking about your sanctification, not your justification. And this word, work out, this verb, it's a very strong word. And it means to labor. It means to work to achieve something. It, it even means to take pains in laboring at something. It, it means to expend great energy in pursuing Christ's likeness. 
This is a long ways away from let go and let God. This is a long way away from a passive, quietistic view of the Christian life where you just sit and meditate and stare at your navel. That, that's not Christianity at all. We're just waiting for some goosebump to, 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 to move you in some direction. Lord, save us from that kind of really um, pseudo-Christianity. No, work out your salvation. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, we are to discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. In 1 Timothy 4, 10, we are to labor and strive at these things. Uh, the word strive, agonizomai, agony, agonizing. It's a fight. It's a struggle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We are to labor. Uh, that word labor in 1 Timothy 4.10 means to work to the point of exhaustion, that you have nothing left to give. I, I used to play football, and I remember there were times I could hardly get off the field at the end of the game. I was just so expended, and a teammate would have to come along. You put your arm, just kind of drape it over his shoulder pads and to help you get off the field. I've got nothing left to give. That's how we are to live our Christian life, pushing, pushing ourselves in this pursuit of following Christ. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul said, I discipline my body and make it my slave. And it, it's that, that word means to strike a blow under the eye. You, you take aggressive measures. Now, please notice how we are to work out our salvation. With fear and trembling. Boy, that's something you're not going to hear today. Fear. It's a Greek word, phobos, which means terror. It comes into the English language as a phobia. <laughs> it means, but this is a good fear. It, it means dread. It means alarm. It means reverence. And it's not the dread of a prisoner to a warden, but it's the fear of a child to the father to take God very seriously, to be awestruck with who God is. And to understand he holds your life in the palm of his hand. And for there to be a sobriety in your heart about becoming more like Jesus. I mean, this word fear is so often downplayed, but not, not with Paul. We know from the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. No one, as, I, as I've said in previous lessons, skips through the narrow gate. No one giggles into the kingdom. No, there is the fear of God that strikes down to the bone as we come into the kingdom of heaven. Um, but we are to continue. We, we grow in the fear of God. It doesn't lessen. It increases. When you read the end of the book of uh, Ecclesiastes and Solomon says, what is the end of all matter? Fear God and keep his commandments. So we start with the fear of God. It ends with the fear of God, and everything in between is to be God-fearing. So how much are we to fear God? I, I can already anticipate what some people would say to me if I was preaching this in a church and it's over. I go out to the lobby and people want to come up and re-preach the sermon to me and, and, and go, but didn't you mean this? Didn't you mean that? So how... So how serious should we take the fear of God? Well, look at the next two words. And trembling. That doesn't lessen this. And we, we can't just write this off as, I don't know, just reverence. There, there's more octane in this tank than just that. It's down to the point, the word trembling, traumas, we get trauma from this word into the English language. It means to be shaking. It means to be quaking with fear. I mean, do you take God that serious? Do you take your Christian life that serious? 
Do you take Bible study that serious? Do you take prayer and your prayer life that serious? Do you take church attendance that serious? Do you take witnessing that serious? It needs to be such a fear of God that there is a trembling within your soul that you desire to please the Lord in all things and that you're not content with where you are in your spiritual life. You want progress. You want advancement. Martin Luther distinguished between different kinds of fear. He referred to servile fear as that fear of a prisoner to a warden. That's not what this is. Luther referred also to filial fear, which is the fear of a child to a parent. I'll tell you this, I love my dad with all my heart, but I want you to know I feared him, and rightly so. Um, this is the way we are to be with God. We're, we're living on his earth. We're drinking his water. We're breathing his air. He's already appointed the day of my death. He's already appointed what's going to happen every day in my life. He, he holds my life in the palm of his hand. He doesn't even have to take my life at the end. He just stops giving it because I'm dependent upon him completely for everything. So, this is incumbent if we are to get to the next level of our Christian walk. And let me say this, we will never have joy until we first have fear. Fear, the fear of God to the point of trembling is the fertile soil from which the seeds of joy grow. The people who are trying to be joyful are the most miserable people on planet Earth. You, you can just go down to the, to the mall or Disney World or wherever you want to go and try to and, and, and find them. They're, they're trying to be happy. They're trying to be joyful. They don't understand that joy is a byproduct. It's not a destination. It, it's a byproduct of fearing God to the point of trembling and taking God so very serious. So we need to understand what this verse is teaching us about our sanctification, that it requires our obedience to the Word of God, and it requires that we work in Bible study. We work in prayer. Don't despise the word work. Work glorifies God. Work honors God. We weren't made to just sit. We were made to serve. We, we, we were made to, to, to carry out God's work here upon the earth. Jesus said in John 9, verse 5, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. I mean, the sun is setting on each of our lives. I, I don't know how long I have to live, but while I'm here with what time I have, I need to work. I need to work the works of God. I need to work out my salvation. I, I, there needs to be an element of fear and trembling in my Christian life, and that alone will lead to the joy of the Lord. People who do not take God seriously, people who do not take their sanctification seriously, are people who do not have joy. They, they, they have to look to other cheap substitutes to try to supply joy. To their Christian life, and they'll never have it. It's only those who take their this call very seriously to the point of trembling as they obey the Word of God and put it into practice in their life. 
may God give you this, this mindset of truly working out your salvation. Work it out in obedience to the Word of God, and you will have great blessing, and you will have great joy. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Lord is saying. Any thoughts? That goes right toward the what we read here. Yes, I was thinking that. It's the same thing, that. thing, cheap substitutes. Yeah. It's a good reminder to, you know, calls us friends, you know, but yet at the same time, he's God and a good reminder to, to we need to fear him. I was thinking about, um, was talking about how uh, you have to give so much and how he talked about being helped off the football field. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to remember, I deal with sports, so I use a lot of analogies and examples. Kellen Winslow was a tight end for the, uh, uh, well, the then San Diego Chargers. And they were in a playoff game against the Miami Dolphins. And it's he's can this is probably considered the uh the best um he probably had the best game of any uh playoff game, any player in, in NFL history. And he just gave and gave and gave in the game and and not just offensively as a tight end. He actually blocked what would have been the winning touchdown or field goal uh, in the game. But when he was done, and he, there were there's pictures of him laying back on the ground. I think in one picture he's getting an IV for uh, because he was dehydrated. So they were giving, and of course in those days they didn't take him back to the locker room to do it. They did it right on the field. And uh, so he, I mean, it was like just unbelievable. And after the game. He was draped over two players, and there's a famous picture of him come, being taken off the field, draped over two players because he could not walk. He gave himself completely to that game, and uh, that's always been. You know, I, I remember the game. I saw the game, and and uh, I remember that. I remember that series of pictures uh, on the film taking him off the field, and how how that is just. Yeah, you know, I, I never, I mean, I, I never was that exhausted and hurt. But I think of people that run, you know, people that run, you know, you see somebody that runs a, even, a, even a, 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 a dash, they're giving themselves and they are spent at the end of that. And I, I had a roommate that ran and he did cross country and he did, uh, uh, relays and he did the mile and stuff and I remember being and looking and seeing how spent he was and I was thinking why are you doing this you know particularly run I, I just I it was but I just remember how spent these these folks are after they run and uh, and and people that do marathons and things I think about you know Michelle uh, Page you know she's doing. Uh, she's going to do, do a uh, tri triathlon here yeah, shortly, yeah. and uh, uh, it's just unbelievable, you know, what she's doing. I mean, she's she's been, and she does other things too that are kind of, uh, you know, swimming things. And actually, the race itself is almost anticlimactic. The real challenge yeah. is training. The training, yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, um, what were the three? You know, he continues his his uh, alliteration uh, in, in presenting this, what were the three uh, things that he wants us to uh, remember here? People. Okay, yeah, people's the, the, the heading. <clears throat> what was the first one? It's not, it's not a P. Address. Right, addressed. 
Second one was pursued. pursued. And the third. What's the other P? A, A, A should be person should be. What is P? <laughs> yes. It's P. Yeah. The P's. <laughs> um, so he's he's given us that again, and it's it's uh, kind of a neat way to uh, to remember them in this particular passage. Anything else? I took a course uh, in seminary one time, and uh, it was by Dutch Sheets, and the title of the course was Becoming Who You Are. And I've always remembered the title of that course, yeah. because that's, in a way, that's what this sanctification is. It's working out and, and working to become who you already are at the moment of your justification. Right. I just like to to follow like that. The, I like the way he said it that uh, you know we we uh, were saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved, and that's the uh, justification, sanctification, and glorification. And the other thing I, I like uh, is the uh, emphasis on the fear of the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, once in a while you hear a thing. Well, there were two gods. One god was in the Old Testament. Yeah. The other god, he's the same. And you know. You can only know his love and enjoy your salvation if you understand the terror you face in front of an angry God. And it, if you put those two together, you know how much he loves you. You begin to love him. But when you realize what was waiting for you, yeah. and he's still, you know, so when I, I commit a sin, when I commit a sin, I realize what I've done uh, in the face of an angry God, and I, it causes you to go to repentance. Did, did you ever have a teacher or a uh, coach uh, who just pushed you and pushed you and pushed you? And uh, just to, you know, and whether or not it was pushing you just to do a little bit more than what you could, what you thought you could do. But when it was over, how did you feel? In did business, you? they call that a stretch objective. And it was Robert Browning who said, a man's uh, reach should exceed his grasp. Yeah. And, and that was a good yeah. statement. So, yeah. and, and so what happens at the end of that time, when it all comes together, when, and again, to use a, a, an analogy from sports, when a championship is won, what is the expression that the players, the participants have, even the fans? Great. Joy. Yeah, you've worked hard at this. Even as a fan, you sit there and you work hard during the game because <laughs> they, if things are not going the way you want them to, you're working hard and trying to say, why does the coach do this? Why don't they do that? Yeah, but you work uh, hard at it. It's a type of joy that doesn't last forever. That's right. In the last scene it's, in the movie Patton, he talked about the Roman emperors coming back as uh, after the great victories and that. And when they had this big procession uh, to go up to Caesar, they were in a chariot, and they always had a slave next to them. And the slave's job was to whisper into their ear, all victory is fleeting. So they keep that in their mind. Yeah. So there is joy, but then there's... Well, you know what? There's next year. We're probably using the wrong word. There's happiness. Happiness. Happiness, because... That, and that's the distinction between what we've been yeah, saying. Right. Happiness and joy. There's no the sense of a fear of a god is right. is really diluted throughout the whole society and the world. It's not yeah. just society; it's the world in general. So there is no fear of God. Just among the believers, and it's always been that way. Yeah. That's right. Just among the believers, it's always been that way. That's why evangelism is so important. Mm -hmm. It is. That's why yeah. evangelism is so important. People who continually work on us. I'm only going by what I know, what I see, but you see these doctors working in this continuous abortion field. They don't fear God. Right. They have no fear. fear of God. Right. No repercussions. You created this baby. I'm going to kill you. Yeah, but the, for five their, their uh, sense is they don't have a fear of God at all. So I want to no. actually, one of the best things you can do is don't you fear God? Because what no. you're doing is against what he's doing. He sat yeah. down in the beginning of the world. You are doing the same thing. Yeah. It's a very condemning, but it's also very convincing. 
Uh, so then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is working you, both to do, uh, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. How does this um, uh, two twelve present human responsibility? Obey, you know. If you really believe that God is in your life and He's calling you and He's leading you, it's your responsibility to respond. To him. You should respond yeah. to him in some way. You know, it shouldn't just let go in your ear and not the other. Right. And then thirteen, what's God's activity? He is empowering you to work that out. Yeah, but it's to work it out to your work for it. It's good pleasure. It's good pleasure. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because those verses tell us there's an obligation on us, on our life. We're obligated. You work out. So you've got work to do. Yeah. It's not like my ticket's punched. I'm going to heaven. Everything's going to be fine. No, I have an obligation now. Yeah. Um, when, uh, what about the uh, phrase about um, you, you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence? What does that mean? I mean, you know, Paul's talking about how they obeyed him when he was there. Yeah. But integrity. Yes, integrity. When they're when when Paul's not there, they're still obeying. Mm -hmm. They're still obeying. And then finally, why is it important that Paul addresses the Philippian believers as beloved? Those are his brethren. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If you ever listen much to particularly R.C., he will refer to his beloved uh, from the pulpit, from his teaching. Um, he'll refer to those, his those are the words of a true shepherd. Yes, a true pastor in the church loves his people. He may not like them on any given day, but he loves them. Yeah, I, I have a friend that uh, he, <clears throat> well, a couple of friends, and they, they use that term beloved. Uh, I spoke to a gentleman uh, on a meeting that was uh, going to become a TE, and everyone was asking him questions. And I, my question to him was, do you love people? Because if you don't, <laughs> you're uh, to try and pastor a group of people is going to eat you alive, unless you love them. And that's the primary call for being a pastor. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's the one that needs to go beyond a pastor and, and be, a, uh, be a professor. <laughs> yeah, you know, yes. the, the the one that if you ask them if you love people, oh, yeah, and they sort of hesitate. Yeah, well, I love people. Yeah. I um, just wanted to know your call. What do you, you get into the uh, nuts and bolts of pastoring? Yeah, you better look. Well, you know, RC did not pastor until he got to St. Andrews. He did not pastor mm -hmm. uh, during uh, during his entire life of ministry. And once he got in there, he, he basically said, I was never ready to do this. But once he got in there, he became a pastor, uh, quite a pastor. So, uh, so you know, it's important uh, that you understand that the people that you, uh, that, that you are serving are your beloved people, that you love them. You must love them even when you don't like them. Yeah. Well, it's the same way with your children. <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs> I should I should not say that my kids. I was said this before. My kids were so easy to raise. I should be slapped. <laughs> Your children grow up, become adults, and they may not become what you hoped they yeah. would be. And you're you can be a little disappointed, but you still love them. Yeah, by the answers, of course, yeah. because they're yours. Why is obedience an important mark of a true believer? What did he talk about the word obey? Do you remember? And that, um, that's really the mark of the Christian. You're obeying those commands. And what, but what does obey mean? When he talked about obey, what did he say it meant? Listen. Listen, yes. Uh, it means that you listen because uh, you, can, you can do stuff and not listen to what you're doing. Somebody... Somebody can give you advice and you don't listen to them. You know, 
Uh, so you you go out and do the opposite, maybe of of what they what they did. And so obeying means listening to what you're doing. <clears throat> what process leads to greater obedience? I was thinking about the children's chat, so I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what process leads to greater obedience? I don't know what he said, but if I force myself and start to obey now, the more I obey, the easier it gets. The knowledge of God. No. The knowledge the fear of God. The fear, yeah. and, and, and God's holiness. You know, if you ever read the book, Holiness of God, have you read oh, yes. God by Scroll? Steve says, you'll do it. Because I've read to your chosen. Yeah, well, you need to read the Holiness of God because that's where R.C. Uh, he actually talks about it was almost like a second conversion for him when he came to understand how holy God is. And uh, so he's got a whole book on it. So it's, it's a great read. Um, Do we have it in the library? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But we should get it. Um, Which book is it? Our Holiness. Holiness of God. Oh, that is the it's fundamental. fundamental. Yeah. That is the seminal word. I read yeah. that when I was. I think that might be in the library. Yeah. Yeah. It's got a long Amazon book list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to find it. But yeah, that's uh, a good one. yeah, it's an excellent book. Just yeah. uh, when I was a crazy charismatic and reading it, I still read that book. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute, there's something else going on. Yes, here. yes. So it, it, he talks about how he was in his room in, yeah. in college and he couldn't sleep. Right. So he got up and he he went to the chapel. And when he went into the chapel and he went and sat down. The holiness of God just overwhelmed him. Mm -hmm. You got to read that book. Yes, it's yeah, yeah, a must-read classic. Yes. Pursuit of holiness. I read. Uh, who wrote that? The one? whole the pursuit that was Tozier. Pardon? Tozier. The pursuit of the pursuit happiness. Of, yes. Isn't that Tozier? Oh, it is Tozier. Yeah, I told you. Yeah. yeah. No, this is just the holiness of God. Yeah. yeah. Must read. Yeah, the pursuit of holiness. God is is closer, and then holiness is probably the third. What are the three tenses of salvation? Justification, sanctification, glorification. And the tenses. Past, present, future. Past, present, future. Yeah. Which one of these is, uh, is related to the command to work out one's salvation? Sanctification. Pre pre yeah, the present. Mm -hmm. The present. How did Martin Luther distinguish the fear of God from other varieties of fear? Yes, yes. it's filial. Yes, and that's like the the, uh, the the fear of a child to a father because a father will discipline. I think that's the best way to say say that. If the filial fear is the fear of the discipline for disobedience. I think, uh, but, but when God does it, there's always love behind it. Yeah, so. and love, and yes, that's the thing. I mean, just like we said, our children might do something that is something that we are, are could be devastated by, you know, um, and yet we still love them. I always thought it as like in, in scripture, you'll see a reference to refining gold. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes there's something in me. It's been there a long time, and God wants to work at it, so he'll turn the heat up in my life. And then all this little icky junk will rise to yeah. the surface. Now God says, you're ready to deal with this bill? We'll scrape this off. Yeah. And that is a continual process. But it's a hard process, because he turns that flame on. Yeah. What is the relationship between obedience and blessing? And obedience is always, uh, blessing will follow obedience. Is what he said, mm -hmm. okay. and then the opposite too. If he he tells you not to do something, he's trying to protect you from harm. So if you disobey, you're going into harm. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, uh, as it says here, um, obeying uh, leads us into the very center of His will. When we obey Him, we're getting into the center of His will. When we disobey Him, we're getting outside. Is well. The will is the safest place you can ever be. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
How are Christians to think of the proper place of fear in the working out of salvation? How do we define fear? Well, in this, for me, for me, it's the idea of God is, he went through this in the attributes of God course. Mm -hmm. It's for me to understand exactly who God is. He is the creator. He created me. I'm a, 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 a contingent being. I only exist because of God. How great he is. It's like when, when Paul says, am I the clay to say that a potter? This is God. So if you hold that vision of God in your head, um, yeah, yeah, it was like awestruck. God will not destroy me because Romans 8 says there is therefore no condemnation, right? But there is correction, yeah. yeah. He said dread, alarm, reverence, awestruck, sobriety in our hearts, mm -hmm. um, a fear of a childhood father. He said, No one skips through the narrow gate. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It goes in yeah. giggling. Yeah. yeah. How do fear and joy go together in the Christian life? When we have the awesome of God, awesomeness of God, and that creates that that awe in uh, in us, that brings about the joy of knowing that this 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 awesome God. Created all things, cares for me, and that brings joy. Uh, that brings joy to us. It's true. They say we will never have joy until we have fear. That's, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah, you won't know the joy until you understand. Yeah. The fear. That's a it says it's point. a byproduct of yes. fear. Yes. Sorry about the grammatical error there. I had to <laughs> read the sentence. I thought I had done it right. <laughs> Should be what does, but no, no, that's right. Do what do has both fear. You got the you got what has yeah. both fear and joy taught you about God. Yeah, what has yeah taught you about God? Oh, that last sentence. That's yeah, right. yeah, it's it's oh, long. It's a yeah. reasonable saying. That is diagram that sentence for one of the By the way, I like to diagram sentences, and when I was teaching when I was teaching in the Christian school. I yeah. taught them how to die. They don't teach that. They Shut don't up. teach grammar. Yeah, you, you, know, you know, you know, young Billy, you've got a dangling participle there. Yeah. Yeah, we oh, I, I'm sorry. Don't send me the office. Diagram sentences or, or do any of that. Okay. Teach them what, what they need to do. And can you imagine yeah. some of the sentences Paul writes in the Greek? If you yeah. look at that, how would you like to try to diagram one of these? It's not two whole paragraphs. It's really just one sentence. Yeah. yeah. You really run out hard. of board space. So, uh, what do both fear and joy have taught you about God? Well, the fact that um, the more I fear Him, the more in awe of Him, the more joy I have. That's right. And and uh, and so, the fear is an, uh, an awesome fear. It's not a frightening fear. It's not a frightening. I like that song. Uh our God is an awesome God who made, and he wasn't just kidding when he wouldn't put on the bridge when you kicked him out of the <laughs> Good song. All right. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility always work in tandem together. Sovereignty. They always work in tandem together. Though well, that's true and false, I would say true for the Christian, yeah. Yes. Yes. When we're, when, and, and just, you know, remember the context of this is this the context of this is that working out our salvation is here in traveling. Mm -hmm. Which of the following best describes the role of obedience in the Christian life? Uh, Wait a minute, let me read the question again. It's binding, the best binding, that's what I was saying. Um, it's binding on every Christian. It's not the other three, so it's yep. got to be. Yeah. It's an obligation. It's the old elimination. Yeah, the way it's written in, in the Greek, it's an imperative. Yes, that's what he said. It's an imperative. And it's it's uh, it, it's a, a continuing imperative. Mm -hmm. It's not just in one time. Yeah, right, yeah. 
Which of the following best describes the root word for obeyed in Philippians 2.12? See, we talked about that. Listen, listen. A biblical, biblical view of God's sovereignty and sanctification encourages a mindset of let go and let God in a person's spiritual life. False. <laughs> False. Yeah, there's my cold pilot. Yeah, I'd rather have him be a pilot. Means you're steering the ship? Oh, no. Which of the following synonyms best describes a biblical view of the fear of the Lord? Terror. Mm, yeah. Uh, phobia. Um, Phobos. Uh, all except which of the following, all except which of the following statements are true about a biblical view of work? Uh, all, all are true except. Uh, uh, D. D. Yeah. That would be a workspace salvation. D. Yeah. Okay. All right. I will believe Okay, next week, 15. God is at work. Ready? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that um, when we work at our salvation, or our sanctification, I'm sorry, when you work at our sanctification, um, you are involved in it, and your sovereignty is worked out through your providence. And as we see these things worked out, we can uh, more clearly understand our relationship with you, and that will bring us joy. We ask, Lord, that you will always help us to distinguish between what brings us happiness and what brings us joy. And may it always be that our joy comes from you. Lord, we pray that uh, as we come to you today uh, to worship you, that we might worship you from our joy, our joy of being uh, in you and with you and a part of your kingdom. And so, Lord, we pray that uh, you would put the things that we seek in happiness behind us today so that we can have the joy of our salvation. Lord, we pray that uh, you'll be with Steve, be with Jim Bigler today Thank as you. they lead the service. Give Steve uh, uh, a great anointing of your spirit as he, as he brings the word to us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I guess I am. Steve says, you will do children's church. Are you just trying to I'll figure it out when I get up there. Okay. I assume they give you a heads up. I have to figure Keep it out. Keep it short. Huh? Yeah, he, already, I have, he already said that. I gave